I am grateful to Alain Berthoz and Isaac Fried for having invited me to deliver this lecture. Uh, I attended the first uh, seminar two years ago of the uh, IOS on Syndrome E. Unfortunately, I was not able to come uh, last year. I am happy to be uh, here tonight uh, to participate to the third one and to uh, make some modest reflections. I should emphasize that I am basically a lawyer and not at all a specialist of uh, neurosciences. I must therefore plead for your indulgence uh, when I deal with some concepts or applications of the neurosciences. My uh, short and modest reflections will, will focus on the feasibility, uh, usefulness, and possible dangers of bringing together neurosciences and the law, uh, what has been called neurolaw, uh, neurodroit, since the beginning of uh, the 1990s. The main legal branch concerned is, of course, criminal law, which fits well with the general theme and approach of this symposium uh, devoted to violence and crime. But other fields of the law are interested as well. Uh, number one, I'll focus mainly on criminal law. Uh, the idea of, uh, let's say, introducing some factors of anatomy and uh, biology in order to determine and uh, potentially explain the nature of uh, the offenders dates back, as you know, to uh, the famous Cesare Lombroso at the end of the 19th century, with uh, his very controversial and uh, now widely, but uh, not completely, abandoned theory about the criminal bonds, crimen criminal ne. Much more recently, uh, the meeting between uh, neurosciences and the law appeared in the United States, both in theory and in practice, some 20 years ago. <clears throat> in theory first, I mean by that in the conceptual world, interdisciplinary research has developed, indeed, in some American universities, especially in the Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, including the MacArthur, uh, MacArthur Foundation, uh, which uh, fosters a project of the network Law and Neurosciences, directed by Professor Owen D. Jones. Such research has been gathering lawyers and more generally specialists of social sciences and neuroscientists. But obviously, the countries where new law is developing, sometimes fast, is much more wider and includes countries such as Australia, Canada, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and others. The main fields of uh, research involve the way in which some anomalies or diseases in uh, the brain may affect the behavior of a person, eventually becoming an offender, with consequences <coughs> about notions such as insanity, guilt, and finally, legal responsibility. Other important studies concern the manner in which evidence may be brought with consequences on a criminal trial. Techniques as old as hypnosis or lie detection are systematically analyzed and criticized. Obviously, the improvement of neurosciences and of their tools is changing the approach of say techniques and methods. For instance, the classical way of detecting lies through the polygraph is progressively substituted by new techniques, such as the recourse to electroencephalography, EEG, <coughs> sorry, 
or functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. In other fields, other brain investigations can be utilized, such as uh, positron emission tomography, PET or PET scan. However, since it, uh, if these techniques begin to be used in justice, notably in the United States, as regards the accused person or the witnesses or even the plaintiff, it is uh, with serious caution due to the insufficient reliability of, for the time being at least, in, uh, uh, in terms of evidence. I'm sorry, I have some difficulties with the light. But other basic problems may arise. Uh, for instance, uh, neuroscientific research shows that the development of the human brain is slow, and I refer to Alain Berthoz, and that maturity is not reached before the end of the teens. Merci beaucoup. Nevertheless, the legal age of uh, criminal liability varies enormously. Eight years in Scotland, 10 years in England and Wales and Switzerland, merci. 12 in the Netherlands, 13 in France, 14 in many countries, Germany, Italy, Japan, China, Russia, 15 years in Sweden, 16 in Spain and Portugal. Should not there be an international harmonization? The United Convention on the Rights of the Child admittedly recommends that the minimum age be fixed by the states, but it does not fix it itself. As an important example, I ought to be, it ought to be mentioned that in 2005, the US Supreme Court delivered a very important judgment, Roper versus Simmons, reversing its previous case law, Stanford versus Kentucky in 1989. The court ruled by five votes to four that inflicting death penalty to juveniles was unconstitutional since the mental and cerebral development of the juveniles under 18 years of age are not ended this being revealed in particular by the application of neurosciences. By the way, between 1989 and 2005, neurosciences have grown up and their influence as well accordingly. Nevertheless, the main legal argument of the majority expressed by Justice Kennedy in Roper versus Simmons is the, I quote, the international evolution of standards of decency. Now, as regards practice, it is not exaggerated to say that now the neurosciences are, if not invading the courtrooms, at least entering them and more and more influencing the outcome of the trials. The lawyers try to invoke them, especially in terms of evidence, in order to demonstrate the guilt or the innocence of the accused person, or to plead for mitigating or sometimes aggravating circumstances, or even to show that he or she is not legally responsible. Sometimes the barristers plead, my client is not responsible, it is his or her brain. Are we responsible for our brain? I put the question. This last aspect raises a problem which is far from being simple, namely the possible conflict between the free will of the individual and the determinism affecting his or her behavior. Last night, I discussed the matter with uh, professors Fried, Bertels, and Rawls. Criminal law, generally speaking, implies the existence of free will, libre arbitre except for persons not having discernment when they commit the criminal action, usually young children or mentally ill or insane people. The application of neurosciences in practice may indeed lead to a conclusion of non-liability in criminal terms or the reverse. The judge and the jury 
as first to determine whether a proof is admissible, then if it is reliable, and finally to what extent its weight, balanced against other evidence, is affecting the decision to be made, both on the guilt or innocence, and on the sentence. Of course, the different national legal and procedural systems are not affected in the same manner by the ways and means of evidence and by the role of the lawyers or of the jury. Common law systems based on adversarial procedure are quite different from the so-called continental systems relying on inquisitorial procedure. And the role of the judge is quite different from one system to the other. Moreover, in terms of predictive justice, the risk that the accused be eventually a reoffender or not can be assessed following some neuroscientific applications. The experts generally get a growing importance. One example may be given of that importance, the extremely sensitive case in France of Vincent Lambert, where the French Conseil d'État, the highest administrative court, decided to set up a panel of experts with recognized competence in neurosciences in order to clarify the concepts of unreasonable obstinacy and of artificially sustaining life. This court relied on the experts' report, as eventually did the European Court of Human Rights in the same case by a 2015 judgment. Some national systems have started to codify the rules of the neuroscientific proof. For instance, in France, in the wake of the revision of the bioethics legislation in 2011, a new Article 1614 of the Civil Code has been introduced, which reads as follows. Je vais le lire en français d'abord et en anglais ensuite. Les techniques d'imagerie cérébrale ne peuvent être employées qu'à des fins médicales ou de recherche scientifique ou dans le cadre d'expertise judiciaire. Le consentement exprès de la personne doit être recueilli par écrit, préalablement à l'examen, après que la personne a été dûment informée de sa nature et de sa finalité. Le consentement mentionne la finalité de l'examen. Il est révocable sans forme et à tout moment. In English, cerebral imaging techniques can be used only for medical or scientific research purposes or within the framework of judicial expertise. C'est ça qui est nouveau. That is new. The explicit consent of the person must be collected in writing prior to the examination, after the person has been duly informed of its nature and purpose. The consent shall indicate the purpose of the examination. It can be revoked without formalism and at any moment." End of quote. There is no case law as yet, but under this provision, it is clear that in a trial, a judge could ask an expert with the consent of the person, to proceed to a magnetic resonance imaging exam, for example, to submit him to lie detection. It should be observed that almost 20 years beforehand, evidence through uh, genetic imprints, DNA, has been already admitted in law in France, Article 1611 of the Civil Code, and is now frequently utilized in justice. Perhaps cerebral imaging techniques will sooner or later become also a current means of evidence, even if the use of DNA is obviously more reliable and more objective, between inverted commas, at least for the time being. My second point is the possible application of neurosciences out of criminal law. In civil law, it happens that the validity of an act depends upon the discernment of the person and upon his or her free will, either in the case of contracts, 
or for unilateral acts such as a will. And this dates back to the Roman law, actually. If the insanity of mind of the co-contractor or of the author of the will can be proved, the outcome is that the contract, for example, an insurance contract or contract for purchasing goods or services, or the will, will be null and void. Even marriage implies the free consent of the spouses. Therefore, the lack of discernment in most legal systems is a case of nullity of conciliation of marriage. In the old uh, French law, there was a, a say, en mariage trompe qui peut, in marriage, <laughs> cheats who can. It's not possible anymore. <laughs> well, before marriage, after marriage, it's, it's maybe different. <laughs> Examples are often shown of trials whose purpose is to obtain from the judge to cancel a contract or a will or of a marriage. Again, the problem of evidence is crucial, and neurosciences could offer means of proving the lack of discernment or insanity of a person, as well as his or her lack of self-control. It must be recalled that, generally speaking, the standards of proof are less strict in civil law, where the concept of likeliness is acceptable, than in criminal law, where the most common standard is a proof beyond reasonable doubt. Number three, is the relationship between neurosciences and the law a dangerous one? Possibly yes. For instance, the use of lie detection methods and techniques must be taken very seriously and very cautiously due to many scientific hurdles including the uncertainty of its results. In addition, everything which may be considered as an invasion of the privacy of the individuals is to be deemed as contrary to the fundamental right to respect of private and family life and should be subject to strict conditions, for instance, to the explicit and clear consent of the person concerned. Other human rights could be infringed, like the right to silence and to no self-incrimination, or the right to one's personal data. Parallelly to neurolaw, neuroethics have to be developed. Judicial applications of neurosciences must be limited and controlled by the legislation in order to avoid any anarchical development. Another serious potential danger lays in the assessment Alain Berthaud, of the dangerousness of an individual. Personal freedom and presumption of innocence run the risk of being jeopardized by this relatively new concept of dangerousness, which reflects much more a need of social defense than the interest of the human being, which nonetheless deserves the utmost attention. Human behavior is probably more complex than a biological or neuroscientific model of the functioning of the brain could demonstrate or infer. It is true that the various applications of neurosciences are able to provide the judges and the police with tools to evaluate the possible danger of an offender, but again, they are subject to mistake and to overinterpretation. The temptation for a judge or a member of the jury or a law enforcer is to trust too much the data provided by neuroscientific examinations, considered as more convincing and more scientific or objective than the more traditional psychological investigations. This cannot be overweight. My first and last point is the following. Anyhow, the connection of in or intersection between neurosciences and the law is also useful and even precious. 
in many fields, in criminal law, but equally in civil law. The sincerity of the testimonies, by example, can be checked through the use of neuroscientific methods. The interest of the victim in both criminal and civil matters and the necessity of providing them with a fair compensation have to be taken in consideration and neurosciences may help. Even the predictive policies under caution and strict conditions could be developed thanks to neurosciences and certainly the potential danger represented by serial killers or terrorists can be limited with the help of the application of or some neuroscientific methods and techniques, even if I must insist on the fact that legally and ethically they have to be controlled. Human freedom is too important to be endangered by speculative conclusions. But still, neurosciences should not be put aside, not more than fingerprints, biometry, databases, or DNA. Scientific law enforcement has to be encouraged rather than prohibited. That is why interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary studies and research associating neuroscientists and lawyers and perhaps other specialists, sociologists, political scientists, and so on, are worth being undertaken. The most important is the awareness of both the advantages of applying neurosciences in the legal world and their dangers. I admit I am in favor of such an approach. This reminds me of the fructuous dialogue entertained since some 40 years ago between computer technologists and lawyers, which enabled the adoption of national legislations and international conventions, for example, in the field of computer and personal data. Contrary to what was feared by some, that did not hamper the development of informatics and at the same time that permitted to reinforce the protection of fundamental freedoms. The same applies to me for neurosciences and the law. As you know, I am chairing the Foundation René Cassin, International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg. I am therefore particularly sensitive to the protection and development of human rights and fundamental freedoms. If the idea can be agreed on, I could submit to our governing board the proposal to organize, organize a specialized interdisciplinary workshop on neurosciences and human rights. This would be a step, modest but not to be neglected, towards a possible future interdisciplinary project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, talk and also your, I think, pioneering proposal that you formulated at the last, the end of your talk.